Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who are joining us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I would ask everyone here in-house for that courtesy to see that cell phones have been turned off. That's always appreciated. Uh, we will, of course, post this program presentation on our website within 24 hours for everyone's future reference as well. And our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our guest today is Walter Lohman, director of our Asian Studies Center. Mr. Lohman, before joining us, Mr. Lohman served as senior vice president and executive director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council for four years. He also served the council as senior country director representing American interests in Indonesia and Singapore. He has had service on a senior professional staff for the Republican House Foreign Relations Committee, as well as serving as policy aide on trade, defense, and foreign policy issues to current Senator John McCain. Please join me in welcoming Walter Lohman. Walter? Well, thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, you know, we, um, we're trying something new at Heritage. Um, and I appreciate you coming out and being a part of it. Um, three years ago, we started something called the Japan Fellows Program. Um, last year, we did a report on the Japanese budget um, situation and an attack on Keynesianism. Um, we, we published that in English, and then, and then we actually translated it into Japanese. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the former to try to make some policy impact because I think most of our audience currently also reads English. Uh, translating to Japanese is more than anything to show that we're committed to, um, we're committed to Japan, we're committed to making these ideas work in Japan, not so much that our audience actually needs to read it in Japanese. Now we've produced this report on innovation that you all are here to hear about today. Um, we, we hear a lot about innovation from our Japanese friends and what, what prompted this report was the fact that no one could actually tell us what it means seemed more like a magic bullet, uh, uh, a magic solution that enabled you um, to talk about change without talking about all the hard stuff that needed to be done. Um, so we produced a report, and we were very, very fortunate to um, have a real expert uh, to help us do that. Masazumi Ishii volunteered his time and is volunteering his time today to be here uh, to, to write about innovation in Japan and to, to speak about it during his trip to Washington. Um, uh, Masazumi has 25 years experience in the technology business and extensive experience in the, in the venture capital world. Um, he has a BS in mathematical engineering and instrumentation physics from University of Tokyo and a master's degree of science, uh, a master's uh, Masters of Science in Computer Science from Stanford University. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you, you doing this. Um, it, it really means a lot to us. Um, he's co-author of the report with a former Heritage uh, employee named Derek Scissors. I can't tell you how much it pains me to say that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but he is former. He's now at uh, AEI, so he's uh, still within the family. Uh, he's just living with his aunt and uncle for a while. Um, he was here, uh, Derek was here for five years as Senior Research Fellow for Asia Economics. Um, we're really glad to have him back um, for, for the purposes of today's uh, conversation. Uh, Derek is a graduate of Michigan. Uh, that's one thing, I don't have to hear about Michigan football anymore, which is nice. Um, he has a Master's in Economics from Chicago and a PhD in International Political Economy, also from, from Stanford. So, as always, welcome back, uh, Derek, and welcome, Masa. We're glad to hear, have you here. Um, why don't we start with you making your presentation. We'll sit in the audience and come up afterwards for, for a conversation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to uh, this beautiful city of Washington, D.C. Uh, not much traffic this morning. A um, couple of things I'd like to mention before I start. Um, I come from, uh, I'm based in Silicon Valley now, so wearing tie, jacket and tie, that's an, quite an unusual honor for me. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate uh, 
you know, uh, for that uh, uh, opportunity. And the second thing is that uh, I am not a scholar or uh, academician, so uh, rather uh, I'm a, a practitioner uh, in venture capital and uh, actually working with uh, corporations uh, in Japan and the United States to help them uh, develop their business. So uh, if we get into very deep discussion of uh, uh, economics, and politics. I am not quite sure if I can. Uh, I'm qualified to answer all the questions. Probably, Derek, uh, you could uh, help me with that. So, uh, with that, uh, um, I'd like to start my uh, presentation. Um, let's see. Well, um, as uh, most of us know, that uh, Japan had like 40 years of uh, steady growth after the war, uh, followed by almost 20 years, or probably more than 20 years of uh, stagnation. And, uh, uh, well, look at this. Let's look at the, uh, the first slide. So, as early as 1990 or 2000 even, uh, Japan was uh, fairly in a good position in the world. Uh, let's look at the uh, ranking of GDP per capita. Well, the third in the world in uh, 2000 but came down to, uh, 2000, uh, to 25th by 2011. Share in world GDP, back in 1990, uh, Japan had 14, more than 14% 14 of the share of GDP. By 2011, it came down to 5.6%. Now, competitive ranking by IMD, IMD, as you know, uh, it's uh, a business school in uh, uh, Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. Uh, they <clears throat> publish uh, every year a competitive ranking of uh, uh, various companies, uh, uh, countries. And uh, in that, Japan was uh, reported to be uh, number one back in 1990. But by 2011, it was, uh, went way down to 27th uh, in the world. So as you can see, uh, Japan has entered a very long, dark tunnel about 20 years ago. And it, Japan is just about to come out of that tunnel, as I see it. Um, so in every country, the uh, economy, genuine economy is uh, the growth. Its growth is derived from um, uh, labor, land, capital, and innovation. Japan's case, certainly the land is very limited, right? Uh, labor, Japan is the fastest aging country in the world. The capital, probably in a capital, return from capital could be improved by reduced borrowing, public borrowing. But it's, it's been proved that it's very difficult to implement. So, most likely the, uh, the innovation would be the one who, which, you know, Japan, uh, J Japan should uh, uh, take seriously as a means to grow into the future. So that's why Derek and I started uh, uh, writing uh, this paper you uh, may have a copy of uh, this morning. Um, uh, so I'd like to focus my talk on the, the innovation in Japan. And uh, do I just go talking, keep talking, or uh, do I, do we have a discussion, or? Um, why don't question? you make your presentation first? And okay. Can comment on it, and we'll come up, and I'll have a conversation. Right. Okay. So the the first question I have is: uh, Is Japan innovative, or Japan inventive? You know, do they have the capability to do that? There's some statistics here. Japan science and technology level. Uh, two statistics I like to share. One is, uh, you know, how how. Uh, Japanese uh, universities are doing vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, their counterparts in the United States. Uh, this, uh, uh, the left-hand side uh, uh, shows uh, <clears throat> top uh, a 10 universities uh, where invention, inventions are reported uh, by universities, you know, uh, from 1 to 10. And as you can see, see here, the red the, uh, the universities uh, uh, written in red are Japanese. University of Tokyo, Tohoku University, Osaka University, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and Kyoto University. So five universities out of 10 
top universities. They pr have been producing a lot of technology. And that side is a number of uh, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, as you many, many of you know, uh, Dr. Yamanaka won the, the 19th uh, Nobel Prize uh, last year, 19th. And that, that made Japan, as a country, a number eight in the world, after US, UK, Germany, France, Sweden, and Switzerland, and Russia, including USSR. Uh, and he, if you look at other countries in Asia, like India, four, Taiwan, three, China, one, two, and Korea, one. So this means something. This is still something. And I'm, I can be convinced that uh, Japan has the fundamental you know, capability to produce a lot of invention, innovation, hopefully leading towards the growth of business. Based in, you know, based on innovation. <clears throat> well, this is uh, probably I we can skip this uh, uh, slide, but this is just a a, 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 a uh, <clears throat> rough uh, a grasp of uh, a how what are the roadblocks uh, face face facing the uh, innovation process uh, from the uh, researchers' point of view. Uh, River of De Devil, Valley of Death, Sea of Darwin, those are the terms uh, uh, sometimes used uh, uh, in the, the related uh, field. People are involved in R&D are probably quite um, you know, familiar with these terms. But, um, and the question is, uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, you know, invention, innovation happens, but the question is, is this is really happening in Japan. And uh, there are source, different sources of this. One is certainly, you know, uh, entrepreneurial ventures. The other is large corporations. Still today, a lot of the talents are residing in large corporations rather than uh, small entrepreneurial companies. But at the same time, the large corporation, many of those large corporations are struggling based on the old business model, and about to die. So the question is, what, how, do we, how do we deal with this kind of situation? Uh, and uh, one way to look at is the, the venture ecosystem. And probably I don't have to uh, explain this uh, uh, diagram in detail. But in Japan, well, uh, just basically, um, uh, just briefly, <coughs> Uh, as a venture capital, uh, invest in venture startup companies, which are maybe a spin out from uh, universities and research institutions or large companies, and they invest in this company, these companies, and uh, eventually they go public or acquired by large corporations, or they go bankrupt. There's a capital gain then the capital gain is returned to investors, uh, which could be uh, you know, institutional investors or corporate uh, LPs. I have seen, I've been working in this area uh, as a venture capitalist uh, you know, more than 20 years, and uh, so I've been always uh, thinking, struggling, discussing with people how to improve this, because I've seen those bottlenecks in many different areas of this ecosystem. Uh, but probably um, we can discuss this later, but uh, uh, you know, just briefly, when we talk about venture capital, the, I come, again, you know, I come from uh, Silicon Valley. I think Silicon Valley is where it's a fairly unique phenomena where this system is working properly and most efficiently and effectively. In go, in, when you, if you go to Japan, we say venture capitalist, venture capitalist, right? But many people who claim to be a venture capitalist have uh, a background, typically finance. You know, until yesterday, you know, I was uh, just a bank, bank, banking, you know, commercial banking business loan rather than equity financing. I was uh, selling stocks 
until yesterday. Now today I call myself you know, venture capitalist. Okay, we have a lot of money. Uh, so let, let us invest in your company. That's the kind of conversation going on. But actually, in Silicon Valley, or elsewhere, I should be, I, I, should be, I think, the, the true value added of venture capitalists is a, a, you know, ability to provide appropriate advice to uh, startup companies, as well as a human network. Uh, so that's what lack, what's lack, that's lacking in Japan. Um, I may be making a little bit, uh, you know, um, an overstatement, but uh, uh, still, I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, to a big, ex a large extent, uh, what I'm saying is true. Startup companies, a during the past like three years, um, working with the uh, uh, the Japanese government uh, organization, I started uh, a taking another look at. Uh, young companies in Japan. And to my surprise, unlike 20 years ago when I was looking at uh, small companies, well, you know, it's interesting technology, but uh, if I, you know, uh, uh, come to the United States, I was able to e easily find uh, similar technologies. Today, uh, I start seeing, you know, some very interesting technologies that can be very competitive globally. Unfortunately, the However, the management skills are lacking still. That's, a, that's a one, thing, one question, big question mark. Now, what about exit? IPO, merger acquisition? Um, I think in general, IPO market is in, you know, increased, I mean, uh, improving a little bit these days. But during the past uh, many years, uh, you know, uh, Company was talking about IPO, 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 but the, the capital market was not there for uh, many uh, young companies uh, to go public. Merging acquisitions, Japanese large corporations uh, have been uh, uh, quite interested actually in looking at technologies from foreign countries like United States. I've uh, worked with a number of companies uh, that in Japan that were interested in acquiring technology from Silicon Valley companies. But typically, they look down upon Japanese companies. Uh, we can get into that uh, point if you're interested. But because this is a pyramid structure, very large corporation in Japan, they look, that, look at the small, innovative, even innovative companies, small companies. Uh, you know, they are just a supplies to us. And, and sometimes when small companies are really struggling, they will, do, they will acquire those companies as a means to, you know, to rescue them. That's the kind of merger and acquisition that, that's been happening. Not really, you know, from the large corporation's point of view, a, as a means to strate strategically, you know, acquire those companies to grow. So my, one of my theses is that, that if those bottlenecks are removed and money and start flowing, and the pro probably people will start flowing too, and the system will start functioning. Okay, so in doing so, uh, we studied, uh, you know, what kind of factors would be important to foster in terms of fostering the uh, adventure ecosystem. And I compared with Japan with the United States and uh, kind of summarized, you know, what kind of uh, factors are uh, involved uh, in that uh, process. Um, and uh, basically, it, I categorized into three. One is the environment uh, fostered by history and culture, very, very this profound uh, factor, which I think is very, very difficult to change. Uh, Japan is to be, you know, is, is uh, said to be a very homogeneous, rapidly in, uh, in gene, uh, aging. U.S. is basically a global immigrant country and, and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, those factors are very, very deep into this history and society. 
And so it's so difficult to change overnight. Uh, I think I would, I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to say probably it will take you know, 500 years for Japan to change if we tr try to decide to move uh, toward this direction. Uh, on the right here, legal financial tax measures. These are the basically the legal measures that uh, can be uh, implemented if people discuss, decide, and agree. Can be you know implemented. Uh, the question is. Uh, Certainly, you know, uh, if they're implemented and people are aware and uh, uh, actually a, yeah, people act according to these, probably it'll be good. Um, and in fact, uh, since the, the change of uh, the administration from NODA to uh, JDP, uh, Abe uh, administration, I think basically the, you know, we, I, I started seeing a lot of uh, a law that's in, I mean, enacting a, the, uh, these um, uh, issues. Now, the middle category, these are not necessarily a, you know, the laws, but some things that, uh, and also it's not uh, probably, you know, not really too deep into the history or culture, but these are some, something that, uh, <clears throat> Uh, that can be made uh, by, you know, people's effort, with effort. Like, uh, well, okay, let's uh, do more, you know, business school. Today there are many more, um, uh, you know, MBAs programs than, like, t uh, compared with, like, 10, even 10, 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, I'm a, a visiting professor at the Waseda Business School, where uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> a, a, a shakaijin, the uh, the students are you know from corporations, not uh, young students, but they are willing to learn to be a global uh, business 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 businessman. And also, uh, I'm a uh, visiting professor at uh, uh, Shizuoka University, a graduate school of engineering, and those students are also uh, you know from Japan, from Southeast Asia, uh, and from uh, corporations within Japan. Uh, but they are willing to learn uh, to be a more entrepreneurial engineering students and trying to you know start uh, uh, new companies. So there, it's a, it, it, it's encouraging. So those things are happening, and uh, um, uh, if something need to be done, probably you know this can be you know. In this uh, section, the, uh, a lot of uh, effort could be made by just people agreeing, let's do it, you know, like a grassroots kind of effort. The, the, there are, <coughs> this, that part, <coughs> there are a lot of uh, a, a role that uh, the government can play, I think. This part would be very difficult. Uh, Japan is known to be a very loyal, you know, uh, to uh, like a Confucius culture. Uh, whether that's uh, good or bad, you know, that's not very compatible with uh, innovation uh, quite often, I have to say. Um, <coughs> so, those are things. <coughs> and uh, uh, based on this uh, Factors. Derek and I uh, uh, wrote this paper, and uh, here's the uh, uh, summary of uh, what uh, uh, we want to say, uh, and we call it uh, a platform for uh, revitalization. And the basic point is the first point is that uh, Japan. One of the, the you know stagnation of Japan is the reason for that is that uh, uh, you know the large corporations have been sort of protected artificially to survive by the government and uh, other means. And uh, our point is that failing firms, the struggling firms should uh, fail, and failing companies probably should, should let go and if, if it, in the open, fair competition. Uh, 
that's uh, probably the biggest uh, point. Uh, the secondly, the today, <coughs> uh, if you look at the uh, employer, the company, and the employee's relationship, from the employee's point of view, it's very hard to leave a, a company he or she is working and uh, start a new thing. That's the environment in Japan. Why? Because... Uh, well, I can give you a couple of uh, examples. One is uh, the employee's compensation and uh, the service that employees provide uh, to the service, I mean, to the employer, are not real-time correlated. In other words, early days, when you're, you know, at a young tenure, you, you're basically what's happening is uh, you're investing your human capital to to help the company. Now, if you wait until you're like uh, 40 or 50, then that's a time when you, know, you start recouping your investment. Your salary will go up, go up. And if you're lucky and you're smart enough, you're smart enough and you're lucky, then you may become a president. So uh, people are very, I mean, discouraged to, to leave the company to start new, something new. Uh, also, another thing is, uh, example is like uh, 401k. There's a Japan, Japan 401k. But the question is, is it really portable? You know, like at, at the age of uh, 40, as an as employee of a company, you know, I have accumulated a certain amount in my uh, a, 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 a retirement account. Uh, and I, I have a very good idea and, and wanted to start a new company. Uh, now I have, uh, I'm married, I have uh, two children uh, who need a lot of money for education. I bought uh, a condo in Tokyo, so I, I, I'm under a lot of uh, financial burden. And uh, if, you know, I start a new company or move to a new company, if uh, the the pension fund is not there. I mean, there's no 401k. Uh, I cannot take it with me. It's a, so uh, Jap J Japan's 401k is not really portable uh, in that sense. That's another deterrent uh, in uh, terms of starting new, uh, new things. Um, <clears throat> and uh, third, uh, the, the economic freedom. This is, I think, uh, the heritage term that uh, how easy or difficult is it to, uh, you know, do business in uh, in a country? Uh, is uh, is uh, World Bank or mm, the ease of doing business? Another, yeah. Uh, so, in the recent report, in Japan is twenty fourth among the developed countries. That's. Uh, that's quite, quite, uh, you know, uh, a negative <laughs> factor, I have to say. Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, totally different. Very, very easy to start uh, new companies. Fourth, the, as I said in that uh, a venture ecosystem diagram, I think Japan needs more of established and I mean uh, uh, sophisticated uh, then, I mean uh, financial experts expertise uh, it's improving but it's not enough today it should be uh, improved and finally um, the you know I don't mean to be well as if you go to Japan you know you don't see many Japanese uh, uh, women uh, executives but in fact uh, a this global gender gap report published by uh, a Davos uh, uh, World Economic Forum reports that Japan is uh, 101st among the uh, 135 countries. And uh, I understand that only 1.3%, 1.13% of Japanese board members are women. That's uh, that's quite uh, a a phenomenon.
And the one study says if a job, I mean, uh, women are have more, I mean, jobs like in the United States, the economic impact of women working in Japan will be probably, you know, 10 to 20 percent easily. Uh, so these are the uh, platform for revitalization we uh, discussed and uh, uh, summarized. Um, maybe I, here I should st stop. Um, I have more slides if you, depending on the discussion, I can come back, but this is where. First one? Yeah. No, no. Oh, the first one is fine. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Actually, the last page says, uh, uh, you know. Can you see if I can make it dark for now? Mm -hmm. We will darken it while we're talking. Yeah. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, can you see if they're can make it dark. Actually, they can darken the darken screen. Darken the screen. Turn, turn it off. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks. All right, Derek, why don't you pick up here? You're used to ominous music. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so Masa is you know did the heart of the of the presentation. I'm gonna start at the kind of intro and then I'm gonna extend a little bit at the end. So he's done the middle 60% and I'm gonna do 20% on the on, on each side or maybe it's more like 15% on each side. Um, let I, I just, everyone should remember, why are we talking about this? And that's kind of what partly what motivates the paper. I, I don't, GDP is not a pr very good measure uh, for a lot of things in economics. I won't go on a long speech about this. But by wealth, Japan is still a richer country by wealth than China. It's still the second, in terms of aggregate wealth, is the second largest uh, economy in the world. And that's really the much better measure of economics than GDP, because uh, economic size, GDP is just an annual output measure. It doesn't accumulate. So we should be constantly talking about the Japanese economy. When the, when the financial crisis hit, we should be talking about What's Japan going to do in the financial crisis? It's going to change this. It's going to change that. I mean, now the world is kind of in this period of, of slow, uncertain expansion. And what's Japan going to do? Japan should be this big factor. Um, and yet it's not because Japan doesn't move very much. I mean, this is, this is like uh, there's a giant in the room. And at the beginning, when you get into the room, you think, wow, that's a giant. We really have to think about the, what the giant is doing. But if the giant never moves, then you just start ignoring the giant, no matter how big it is. And, and that's the background for, for thinking about how to, how to revitalize the Japanese economy. We've almost, after the 20 years that Masa referred to, I mean, maybe not people in this room, but certainly people across the street uh, on the Capitol, uh, when they aren't thinking about a government shutdown, they still don't think about Japan. Because Japan is the giant that never moves. So why bother? And if we can get this giant moving again, doesn't even have to move very fast. You know, the U.S. isn't moving very fast, but it is moving. If we get the giant moving again, um, Japan becomes a much more important factor in the global economy, becomes a much more valuable ally to the United States. And I know we all know this, but I think outside of, of people who follow Japan, Japan's just kind of been forgotten um, because it doesn't seem to do anything other than show up and offer development finance to various countries. Um, and, and that isn't necessary. There's a, there's a huge stock of wealth in Japan. On, on a number of indicators, Japan is still doing okay. It's not doing great, but when you have an aging economy, a aging society, and you don't have natural resources, I mean, imagine what the U.S. would be doing now without shale gas. Now, shale gas partly comes from American innovation. Let's give the United States credit, but it partly just comes from the fact that the U.S. has more natural resources. So Japan is not doing so poorly. It's just... It, we're, we're looking for a way for Japan to do better because it really would make a difference in the global economy and even in global diplomacy. And I think we've all forgotten that because we've forgotten what the 1980s were like when Japan was still moving. And we're so used to Japan being stuck that we don't realize this is an important topic, or at least potentially important. It could be important. 
So that's the, that's the framework for why to, why to talk about this. And as Masa said, you know, I, I wrote a paper on capital last year, which is government borrowing depresses the return on capital in Japan, which is very unfortunate because labor is not going to drive Japanese growth and neither is land. And when I was presenting that paper, people started talking about, why don't you talk about innovation? And here again, Japan does not, we, I know, we, we talked about this last night, I know Masa, and he knows far more about this than I do, we don't want to give the impression that Japan does badly at innovation. It's not that Japan is poor. Oh, I can't believe you know, Japan is, in a ranking of 1 to 100, Japan is a 20, and the U.S. is 93. That's not true. The problem is that there's a huge burden on innovation in Japan because the other sources of growth are not adequate. Uh, if, if you have, a you know, Saudi Arabia for a long period of time hasn't had to innovate. You just had to pump out oil. Here, here's the oil, natural resources, done. India right now is missing a chance for, for a massive amount of growth because they have a hugely expanding young working population. That could help Europe, Japan, uh, Russian Federation compensate for their shrinking working populations. If you have those kind of resources, then you don't need to innovate as much. Japan doesn't have them. And so Japan cannot survive with an okay innovative performance. And the, the examples that, that Masa put up there, it's not that there is no angel financing in Japan. It's not that the tax regime is awful. It's not, it, we're not talking about Japan doing incredibly poorly on these, on these uh, factors, except for women, which I think is an important point. Um, Japan does okay, 24th. 24th in the world out of 180, 190 countries is not such a bad performance. But for Japan, in innovation, Japan has to be eighth, it has to be fourth, because that has to carry the Japanese economy. And against that standard, that very high standard, Japan is doing poorly. So when we talk about uh, what needs to be changed, Japan doesn't need, can't have decent regulations on investment. It can't be a reasonable environment for venture capital. It has to be the best environment, because Japan needs that. And as you know very well, when you're talking about money, Money moves very, very easily. If you're in Japan and the environment is okay, and you can look around and find a better environment in Hong Kong or Singapore or Australia, you leave, gone. Okay? Capital leaves Japan, hollowing out of the Japanese economy. So in where, because there's so much pressure on Japanese innovation to drive the economy, Japan must excel. And the, one of the discussions, so, so as, as Maz actually mentioned, when I talked about cutting pension payments and, 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 stop, and reducing government borrowing, everyone said, oh, that's very hard. But innovation is also very hard because Japan has already done a number of things and it's not enough. It's, it's okay, but it's not great. Uh, and, and that's why some of these, 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 the, these recommendations are, are harder than they look. They are more involved than they look. Large firms, there has to be some way where there's turnover in Japanese markets, where large firms die and there's space created for small firms. Why? Because that is the incentive to innovate. And imagine if the American energy sector was as stuck as, uh, as, as you know, the Japanese trading houses are stuck. There would be no shale gas revolution because shale gas didn't come from Exxon or Chevron or, or Shell overseas. It came from little companies. You have to be able to see that I'm willing to take this $100 million risk because I can win 45% of this market if it pays off. Not 10%, because 80% is still reserved for the large companies that never go out of business. You have to have turnover, you have to have tumult, you have to have failure to create the right environment for innovation. Japan has some of that. It has had some consolidation in banking, but not enough. <coughs> the second thing that you, know, that, that you have to have is you have to have an extremely high managerial capability. Japan, no one is sitting here saying, that, oh, well, Japanese managers are terrible. But the U.S., and we were talking about this last night, the U.S. actually produces too, far too many MBAs. Now, what's the advantage of that? So we waste money in the training of all these MBAs. Well, the advantage of that is the MBAs are always competing with each other, and some of them get really angry, and they leave the companies, and they start their own companies. And most of those fail. But when you have too many MBAs, you don't have to worry about the managerial capacity for startups. You have enough of that. Even if you've wasted resources in education, your innovation environment is stronger. It's the same thing, in, it, it, it's true with regard to, to, uh, to I, IPO governance, where Japan is doing okay. It's true with regard to venture capital. In all these cases, what you need is not for uh, you know, Japanese government officials to say, we made this improvement, uh, Japan is all right. In a lot of ways, the IMD ranking, um, 
the ease of doing business ranking, you could say 24, 25 is fine, but Japan needs to be in the top 10 and maybe in the top five. So what I would add to, to Masa's presentation, and we can talk about the details, and he's more qualified to talk about the details than I, than I am, is don't think that, well, I can think of good things that Japan is doing in innovation. Clearly, Japan is doing good things in innovation. And look at supply chain management. All right, Japan, Japanese firms are marvelous at supply chain management. So we have areas of strength for Japan innovation. The problem is supply chain management doesn't add to local Japanese wealth. It adds to, to, to indirectly to, to, to the wealth of, of Japanese private citizens through companies, but it adds a lot to foreign wealth as well. That kind of innovation needs to come to Japan. Um, so that, that's what I would add on the end uh, to, sh to sharpen the presentation. Japan is doing okay, and if, if everyone just says, look, this is too much trouble politically, Japan will continue to do okay. It will rack up public debt and private wealth, and the private wealth will fund the public debt, and we'll just continue onward. But I, and I think the Heritage Foundation, even though I, I have no longer here, I think I can speak for them on this point because we've talked about it at length, would like a Japan that does better than that, not just okay. And in that sense, Japan really needs to, 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 to do the hard work and to be the leader in innovation and to sacrifice some large companies and to overproduce MBAs and to have people you know, get tax credits even when they take losses, if they take reasonable chances, things that... That, are not, that may not seem to be ideal policy, but they're necessary if innovation is going to drive the Japanese economy. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. That's, that's really terrific context um, because um, I think we have to keep, keep it all in perspective. I mean, what we're talking about is a way to make a strong Japan. And uh, with the tools available to it now, um, uh, you know, it's got to pick some of them up and, and use them effectively or it will just continue to, to click along and not be the sort of ally we need, which ties into our general program here at Heritage. I'm gonna, I want to give everyone a chance to ask, ask questions and maybe think about that uh, for a moment. But um, I, I wanted to raise one issue or actually follow up on an issue both of you, you, you offered. You know, in the um, lead-in, the one, one thing I forgot to, to mention about our Japan program, our Japan Fellows program, is the real heart of that program, which is Kumi Yokoe, mm -hmm. our, our Japan fellow. Um, she has done a tremendous job um, making all of this count. So we can do a paper and we can, we can research a lot of great ideas, but, but Kumi helps us really, really connect those to the people that need to hear it in Japan. She's doing an outstanding job. Um, we, um, we had one of her friends here uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Kosuke Motani from uh, Japan Research Institute, um, who quickly became my favorite guy. Um, I, I, I love that guy. Um, but uh, he, he talked about uh, a lot of real things in the Japanese economy. He talked about demographics. And, and one, of the, um, one of the problems with demographics uh, is that, uh, that, that the, the workforce is underutilized when it comes to women. And, and sort of that, that dovetails with some of the things that, that, that you all talked about, that women are actually um, an untapped resource, both to settle the, demo, the, the sort of the structural demographic problem, and apparently it would have some impact on innovation. So I wonder if, uh, Masa, you could just expand a little bit on the, the impact of more fully utilizing women in the workforce and how it might impact innovation. First of all, I think uh, women are... Uh, Smarter than men, maybe, <laughs> right? <laughs> Talented. Interestingly enough, you know, if you're a, a first son in a family, um, or the little boy, the, you know, suppose you have like four children, uh, boy, boy, girl, and boy. The first son and the last son are kind of, you know, the, the family really uh, take good care of it. And first son, the parents typically say, you know, you're uh, gonna you know, take over our family. And you know, so you have to be very, very, uh, uh, you have to grow and, you know, uh, well, uh, a good person. The, the, typically the first boy will be spoiled, okay? The second boy is, is doesn't have uh, too much ex expectation from parents. So he have relatively a lot of freedom. Okay, the third girl, 
she is kind of, uh, we call it, uh, uh, the second boy and the third girl are like uh, a tail of cat in Japan, we say. The tail, tail uh, you don't need, you know, I mean, the cats don't need tail, right? I mean, <laughs> so we call them the cat. So that means they have, those two, second and third, have a lot of freedom to do whatever they like to do. They don't have to go to Tokyo University. You know, they like to do what, you know, they, they can pursue. The, the third girl, um, uh, the same. But typically, once the, the girl is out in the, uh, the society, they are treated as uh, like serving tea. I mean, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating maybe. Um, and, uh, but some uh, very talented girls, they work hard and uh, uh, they're actually, if you look at uh, like uh, Mrs. Ogata, you know, and a lot of uh, like a novelist, individually they have uh, proved that they have proved that that they have a lot of talent. They can be very very active in the global uh, world. And uh, but this Japanese corporate system has not allowed uh, you know women to uh, perform um, in in their corporate uh, environment. That's very very. Um, well, that's too bad. But uh, I, uh, but uh, uh, banks like Japan led uh, the government led banks like DBJ, Development of Bank of Japan, is now implementing a program whereby they encourage women entrepreneurs, and they do a, a contest, business plan contest of women um, entrepreneurs. And uh, that's, uh, they started that just uh, uh, last year. And it's very, very uh, uh, successful. It's, so it's an encouraging factor. Mm -hmm. Derek, is part of it that uh, you just would increase the pool of available talent and, and ideas? Is it as simple as that by including more women in the workforce? And, and, and maybe, maybe better for Masa, but is, is it a strength in a sense that women are not involved in all of these big, um, all the big corporations because, you know, could it be like in the U.S. where people start a business from home and they have an internet business they use in their, their spare time? Actually, actually, let me share one more point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, one more point I want to add is that uh, the, uh, when, especially women have, uh, you know, give birth to babies, <coughs> they are not, they're supposed to take off for, you know, some period of time. So, be, so if you look at the graph that shows uh, how many you know women are working, or, you know, by time, by the age, then it, it, it shapes like M. This portion mm -hmm. is you know kind of uh, depressed. And uh, so the facilities to help, like daycare center, those should be very very helpful. Mm -hmm. And that's happening also in Japan. Mm -hmm. That's a good good encouraging. Uh, I mean, when in a in a in a labor short country like Japan, the fact that there's untapped labor is just insane. So just the basic thing, it, it's 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 as if it's the same thing as if you don't have enough food, and your country doesn't produce enough food, and then there's land over there, and you just say, well, we're not going to use that land. It's just as crazy. So Japan's uh, labor mobility scores, especially with regard to women, are are really. It, 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 shouldn't, it shouldn't be this way after 20 years of, of, of very slow economic progress that you still have these barriers to labor movement, especially among women. But with regard to, to innovation, I think I would use Masa's ecosystem. There are a lot of different parts to innovation. They're the inventors. And let's say you think, well, women don't really invent things. Okay, well, I don't know that we really know that, but let's say that's true. But then there's also the managerial capability. And if you don't have the managerial capability, then your invention usually doesn't come to market. Well, there are a lot of great women managers. Okay? Maybe you, for whatever reason, you don't, I don't think there'll be that many great women managers. Now we have the investors. You know, we have to have people who are willing to take risks, who see things differently than the bank loan officer who happens to be a man. So there's a multiple, there are multiple parts of this ecosystem, and there is simply no way that, 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 that excluding large numbers of Japanese women can be helpful. You don't know where exactly they're going to fit, but the, Masa's point is you need all of this. If you only have one part of it, you, you have the potential to innovate, but you don't actually innovate. The products don't come to market, they don't boost your economy, they don't make your people richer. 
And so what I'd say particularly about innovation is it is impossible to imagine that there aren't women who can contribute a great deal to one stage or more of the innovation process. And that may turn out to be that there's this big choke point in Japanese innovation, and if we can somehow integrate women, the choke point goes away. <laughs> so it, there are obviously a lot of social parts to this too, but, but when you're changing a regulation on the financial side, that's good on the financial side, integrating women more fully can affect all of the stages of the ecosystem, so the potential is higher. And, and just one more uh, on this. So going back, Masa, to your three categories of change, you don't need wholesale cultural change in order to increase the uh, role of women in the workforce. Because, I mean, that would be, especially you would hear from Japanese uh, experts here in the U.S., you might get immediate pushback. Well, that doesn't happen because women have certain roles, et cetera. But I, I assume that you think you, we don't have to wait 500 years. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, it's changing. Definitely, it's changing. And I started seeing a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs. And also, I started seeing some uh, a, a, uh, executives, women executives. And uh, definitely, the number is increasing. And uh, so it's, a, it's not a linear change, I don't think. It'll be a more like exponential change. You know, once a company's once companies start recognize, oh, you know, this is what's happening, and this, uh, uh, you know, uh, women uh, managers joining us is uh, helping us significantly to grow. Mm. Then, Japan, uh, that's a good mm -hmm. part of Japan. Everybody follows. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, so, so that 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 will change. We have to get a that critical mass. Exactly. Yeah. Then, all of a sudden, right. with l very large corporation, maybe difficult, but. Um, uh, they they are seriously considering that mm -hmm. today. So it, it's changing, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's encouraging also. Thank you. Well, let me open it up to questions. We have yes, sir, right here. Oh, yeah. <coughs> a microphone. We have a microphone for you. Right. Oh, well, since the uh, audience is not so big uh, <laughs> as 500, so probably I don't need this. But anyway, uh, my my name is Yuki Imamura. I have been here in, in this uh, town about. Uh, over 20 years, uh, and uh, the first I uh, wanted to congratulate the Heritage because you picked up such a very important but not often discussed subject of innovation, particularly in this town. Not in uh, Silicon Valley. But Silicon Valley every day, no, every, right. every morning, every <laughs> or maybe lunch, every, every minute. Every minute. <laughs> uh, I, uh, about four, four years ago, I started a group called Washington Innovation Network, which is uh, the win for short, where we discuss science, technology policies, innovation, university, industry collaboration, and entrepreneurship in this town. While we have so many platforms to discuss uh, national securities, uh, economies, education, so on and so forth. And we also started the group, uh, uh, some kind of event called Sakura Science Initiative, which uh, tried to uh, showcase the Japanese science technology uh, on the day of uh, uh, Sak Sakura Matsuri, cherry blossom, that would be uh, taken in every uh, uh, spring. Uh, having said that, the, um, I have always had the problems to, or pains to discuss innovation because what is innovation? Is that different from advancement, progress, development, innovation, and so on and so forth? And we also talk about the science and technology, particularly when we talk about innovation. But as you said, management, management is also subject to innovation. These days we talk about uh, science and arts. So now, uh, my question here is, although we talk about uh, venture ecosystem, we may also have to talk about the, the, uh, the uh, collaboration between universities or research institutes, uh, business, and the government, because each of them has their own roles to reinforce each other. That's one. Uh, one. The second one is, the, how can we 
uh, motivate the local governments or, or universities outside of Tokyo. In other words, this is kind of the issue between Tokyo and others. How can you motivate Japanese economic and innovative or other infra infrastructures uh, as Japan as, as a whole, not rather only by Tokyo? Uh, these are the issues which I want to ask uh, Mr. Ishii to address. Thank you. Okay, first, and thank you. Uh, um, first of all, the, uh, the, the, the definition of innovation. Uh, I've been always using the, uh, the term innovation um, as, uh, you know, new combination. Noe combination, uh, the originally stated by, I don't know, he used the word, I mean, Schumpeter. The new uh, shinketsugo, new connection. So it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it's a little bit different from invention. Sometimes, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, you can invent something uh, new, entirely new from zero. You may, some people may call it, uh, you know, uh, innovation, but it's a really invention. Innovation is uh, do doesn't have to be uh, from zero. It ha can be a small, you know, like pebbles here and connecting coming up with totally new concept, new um, ideas. And uh, in Japanese, it's often translated to, um, as a, a gijutsu kakushin, which is a very narrow interpretation of innovation. Uh, ba basically, you know, uh, it talks about only like technology or software. I mean, hardware software, basically. But I think innovation should include, uh, you know, not only hardware, software, uh, but also uh, solution, service, business model. Uh, it's much, much, and management, you know, service, many, it's much, much broader context. Science and technology, the def definition of science and technology is quite uh, uh, obvious, so probably I don't have to uh, uh, do that, explain that. Now, the, uh, your point on the collaboration between gov the government, the universities, um, and uh, uh, research institutions, Certainly, the business. That's a, certainly part of uh, uh, ecosystem, and that should be, you know, uh, should be definitely encouraged. Um, and uh, in Japan, especially from uh, uh, the uh, the university side, uh, the government side, a lot of effort is happening. Companies are trying to take advantage of what's available to them. Uh, or companies are in private sector, so. Uh, they, you know, behave uh, to optimize the, <laughs> uh, to adapt to the environment, and so that's what's happening. But it's true in Japan now; it's, uh, you know, uh, happening. Um, to the extent, to the extent it's happening, you know, I, I think it should be uh, much more. For instance, uh, uh, like two thousand back in two thousand, uh, you know. The government started. Uh, okay, let's start uh, uh, 1,000 new companies, uh, and in fact, by 2003 or so, uh, like 1,300 uh, com new companies were born. But only a few years later, like by like 19 <coughs> 2009 or so, many companies start. You know, those companies had to. I mean, were uh, were dead and much fewer companies were born. And so it's not really functioning well. It's happening. But so there, there's a lot of room for improvement. So yeah. it's encouraging, but should be, you know, done probably more wisely. There are a lot of uh, things that uh, there's a room for improvement. Now, the, your uh, second point, local um, city, you mentioned local yeah, city. Tokyo versus other cities. Okay. Other okay, I think... Uh, <coughs> Uh, especially like Sendai, uh, Osaka, Nagoya, the, the, those uh, major cities, or Kitakyushu, those uh, major cities have their own uh, initiatives and uh, trying to, uh, uh, especially like Sendai, uh, trying to recover from uh, the uh, uh, disaster, you know, uh, three, uh, three years ago. And uh, mm, so that's happening. That's happening. The, the, so the, uh, the, what's the question the there? Question, you know, um, 
couple of years ago, I was invited by Yamagata City right. to discuss how the innovation of entrepreneurship of Tokyo. Uh, helped. Oh, Tokyo versus city. outside Tokyo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, then they told, the, the city of Fisher told, well, actually introduced me to, to the, uh, the uh, university industry collaboration kind of uh, uh, the facilities. Which right, was like financed a, by like Japanese a, a, a organic electronics valley or something like that. Yeah, but, yeah. And right. the, the building is very, very beautiful. <laughs> very beautiful. Right. Now I asked somebody, uh, the resident, that kind of, that's a kind of the incubator. The young, a new graduate from some university. Then I asked, that, asked them whether uh, there is any problem. And he, he said, yes. Uh, he had uh, some uh, kind of uh, uh, problems of uh, the financing uh, uh, with the, uh, the uh, patent as uh, collateral. Mm. Then the, that facility has a kind of so nice, it's a consultation or advice office. Right. But the people over there didn't know anything about that. Yeah. So he had to go to Tokyo. So, in other words, Tokyo has been really uh, uh, enjoying all those concentration of the inter uh, intelligence and the facilities of financing, mm -hmm. while other part of Japan, particularly those which uh, uh, the rather yeah, small cities, mm -hmm. where they, I think, have a lot of talents, unpolished talents, human resources. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so my question is, how can we uh, encourage these facilities, ecosystems in the local areas? Uh, yes, okay, uh, I got your point. Um, yes, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, Tokyo as a city is not to blame, I don't think. I mean, basically, I think that each city should, uh, you know, uh, make it happen on their own, you know, uh, effort. And certainly, uh, there are some uh, role that government can uh, help, you know. But it's uh, it's not that the, not the government order, you know. It should be a, the government role should be to just help set up the environment so that uh, money can flow more easily and so forth. Uh, for instance, uh, um, we uh, I and uh, some of my colleagues are planning to uh, host a conference in the uh, city of Sendai uh, next uh, fall in the area of uh, uh, medical uh, equipment, medical device and medical equipment. And uh, people at the Tok uh, Tokyo University and uh, city uh, uh, government, they are very, very encouraged that uh, we, uh, you know, from Silicon Valley uh, are coming to help them. And that kind of effort is happening, and so uh, that's uh, one example that uh, you know local cities uh, could take advantage of. The same thing is uh, happening uh, in Osaka. You know uh, what, what was the name of it? Uh, Machikita, you know, innovation town or something like that. So local at local level, um, that's happening. Let me just add. I think your question. I. I I think the combinations of your questions are really good because you have a question about the definition of innovation and then you're talking about there's a problem here. We're sitting in Washington and we're giving you know, suggestions for national government. That's a very top-down kind of idea and we don't really want that. Uh, I mean, we want to have a big platform and talk to people who are policymakers and all that, but innovation can't be done top-down. That's why the Chinese will, are, are failing on innovation. They're trying to order it. As Masa just suggested, you can't order innovation. We really should be thinking about every single person in the country, Japan, the U.S., whoever, is a potential entrepreneur. And most of them probably aren't very good at it. But maybe they can do a, some of them can do a little thing. And that counts as innovation. It's a tiny little thing. Um, you know, I'm at, I'm, my garage door opener doesn't work very well, and I found a way to improve garage door openers. Is this going to change the whole country? No. But it's a little innovation. And we can have lots of little innovations. And then maybe one out of a million people is a real entrepreneur and has a, has a, a big changing innovation. We should really think about, and Masa says this in the paper, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to take risks. Everybody. And so that's something that's, that doesn't come from the national government. It has to be done everywhere. 
and it's a simple message to, 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 to local officials. Think of all the people who live in your prefect, in your city, in your county, as being potential entrepreneurs. Some of them will fail, some of them will do tiny little things that maybe you won't even notice, but it will help. It will be part of a part of a part of a product. And some of them will be, you know, a few of them will be very successful. How can you make it as easy for them as possible? Walter was saying start an internet business. How can you make it as easy for them as possible to start an internet business? If they have this tiny little invention, how can you make it as easy for them as possible to get people to, to get the benefits for the invention? And that's really for every single, you know, every single government official anywhere. Make it easy for them. Get out of their way. It's not... I know that the big companies are here and we're having a meeting in Tokyo or in Washington or, or even in, in, in Palo Alto or Menlo Park in Silicon Valley and we're going to see all the giant companies and deal with them. That's great. But innovation to drive long-term economic growth should come from the whole population, which means all officials should be thinking about how do I, how do I find the entrepreneurs you know, in, in, my, in my county and how do, I, how do I let them get their entrepreneur ability out and that's really more bottom up and so I take your question as saying you know don't forget that you want we want up here bottom up innovation and it has to be done everywhere not just where Tokyo or Silicon Valley or other centers of innovation that's right and I, I think the, 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 the role of the government or the local government could be should be one establish an environment where you know starting new things is not a risky. When we talk about uh, venture, you know, startup, oh, it's a high risk, a high return thing, right? If you go to Japan, that's a typical phrase people use. But uh, my personal um, opinion as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, certainly uh, from the point of view of investor, it's, a, it's a risky, it's a risky invest, uh, investment. In fact, uh, you know, I well in a, in a year maybe I receive 1,000 uh, uh, business plans, and seriously look at 100, and then uh, invest in 10 companies. So 10 companies are 1,000, and then out out of 10, only one company hit home run. Three or four they fail definitely. Another two, three or four they don't know where they're going. But as a portfolio, we can be very successful if this home run, you know, provides like one, three, I mean, uh, one thousand times uh, multiples. It's okay. But from the uh, entrepreneurial point of view, entrepreneur's point of view, the, the beauty of Silicon Valley is that they can fail and they can, so that, I mean, uh, they can repeat. They can do it again because it's not too risky. It, it, I don't say there's no risk at all, but the level of risk is very low in Silicon Valley. That's why people continue, you know. I mean, uh, fate, uh, the, the two factors in the beauty of I mean, Silicon Valley is that one is openness, open to interesting ideas, you know, out-of-box out thinkers is uh, very, very uh, highly respected. Two is tolerance for failure. You can fail, and fa the definition of failure is uh, opportunity to learn. That's a kind of mindset that people have in Silicon Valley. And um, uh, so I think when I come to think about the, the, what the government can do, the local government and, or local other organization, you know, the, to establish an environment that starting new thing is not uh, risky. That, that's one you know, key <laughs> message I like to deliver to, uh, to local yes. cities. Yes, right in the middle. I'm Jin Suk Lee from South Korea. Obviously, uh, there are, I think, dozens of differences between uh, the Japanese and uh, the Koreans. Uh, one of the things, one of the observations that I have made over the years uh, is that um, the Japanese are very reluctant in sending uh, their children to schools over uh, here in the United States, uh, even when they have chances to stay here, like for three years, five years. Uh, on the other hand, Koreans are <coughs> eager to send their children to, the, to schools in the United States. And uh, I um, had uh, a chance to uh, talk with a Japanese, uh, Japanese correspondent based in Washington, D.C. and asked uh, this question to him. Why are you Japanese 
reluctant in sending your children to uh, school here? And his answer was like, uh, we have no merits in studying in the United States. If we go back to Japan, uh, we will uh, have all things to lose instead of uh, a gain. So if a person, if a Harvard graduate goes back to uh, Japan, uh, he, will, he or she will uh, not get into large corporations. Um, if a Tokyo University gra graduate, obviously he has uh, far uh, more chances in uh, succeeding in Japan. Uh, while, on the other hand, if uh, a person who graduated from Harvard or Yale universities in the United States, he or she has every chance to get nice jobs at Samsung Electronics or other large corporations. Do you think, uh, um, uh, Mr. Ishii, uh, there is a, a sort of a cultural, societal uh, side that um, you are uh, not as successful as uh, the, the, the Americans, for instance, in innovating? Thank you. Right. Um, you know, I think your point is well made um, when taking. Um, uh, I'm showing a graph that shows the number of uh, uh, students to the United States from Asian countries. I'm comparing like five uh, different nations in Asia. And, and as you can see, you know, students from India, from uh, 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 China, growing so rapidly. Uh, Taiwan, kind of steadily, stead. Korea, back in 2001. But the same as Japan. But after 10 years, you know, Japan, I mean, Korea increased in Japan is, has declined. And that, I think there's a reason. One is um, 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 a, most of Japanese, especially the, the graduate students uh, from Japan to the United States, are sent by companies rather than as an individual. You know, uh, so the, the companies, while they're in the very dark, uh, long tunnel, they <laughs> became very defensive and they stopped many companies, uh, shrunk or stopped uh, this uh, uh, foreign, you know, study program. That's one reason. Also, the students, when I, when I teach, uh, you know, at university in Japan and so after, you know, a doing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the lectures and session, you know, I asked them, okay, so this is uh, you know, the fantastic story you heard. So would you like to go to the United States to study? And the answer, typical answer is, Bitsuni? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why should I, you know? That's uh, very discouraging. The reason, you know, so, so I, I go in a, a ahead and ask why. So they say, as you say, you know, well, you know, I, I like the United States, but if I spend even half a year or um, one year in the United States, uh, probably I'll miss the chance to get a job back in Japan. And so that's, uh, that, it's not, uh, you know, deep social uh, situation, you know, but I think more of the economic an environment they are put there in. That that was the uh, uh, the reason I think. This this also connects to labor mobility. It should be the case that you switch companies a lot. Maybe you work for some foreign companies in that time. Even if you work for mostly Japanese or mostly Korean companies or whatever country we're talking about, you could work for a foreign company. It's one of the possibilities. And so it's not just you're going to work for this set of companies and they have this valuation of a foreign education and this is the only thing that matters and your career path is like that. And if you have that, then you can say everyone has the same answer. Well, I'm all, all of us are going to work for these 15 companies. They don't care about getting an education overseas and if we miss our time, then we won't get the jobs that we want. You know, everybody comes out of school at the same time. Everybody enters the workforce at the same time. It's all very regimented. The more labor mobility you have, the more idea of, well, no, we, of course you can do something different. Of course you can switch companies. Of course you get a different kind of education. That increases the value of, of foreign education. And so I, I take your point, and I'm not saying it's the whole problem, but I think part of the problem is lack of labor mobility. 
that people should be switching jobs a lot more and moving a lot more and changing fields a lot more in Japan than they do. And then a degree from, you know, not the normal process of University of Tokyo and so on has more value. Great. Other questions? You know, um, one of the things that uh, I've learned over the last three years, probably the thing I've, I've learned best about Japan is how little I really understand about Japan. <laughs> and every, uh, every conversation I, I, I have, I think, increases the level of uncertainty. Uh, but that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's, uh, that uncertainty allows you to explore and learn more. And I think that's sort of what we're, ta we're talking about here. We, we, need, we need more and more of that. This has been really terrific, uh, terrific exchange. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to, to do this with us. And, and same with you, Derek. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. Thank you.